Cho, thank you very much. Um, could you say something about the, the your work looks like a conservative nightmare? How do you move it around that enormous scale and the apparent fragility of the materials? Are you a conservator? No. Ah. <laughs> no, I mean. <clears throat> um, the, the conservatives who know my work really well say, uh, know that it's really solid. You know, it's really solid work. But it changed. It changed. And, and, and what we want is changing, you know. But the work changed anyway. You know, even works you, 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 you hold on a certain state, they change the next century. The people have, another, have other eyes, you know, the eyes change. So the work changed all the time. Yes, but given that one of the subjects that you deal with is memory, mm -hmm. and you know it's been well documented that reclamation of certain contaminated myths by the Germans, or by the Nazis rather in Germany, or the expiration of a tradition that was all but, all but obliterated in Germany, the Jewish tradition and so on. Um, given that you deal with that idea of memory and so on, um, there has to be a sense of you wanting the objects that you create to have as long a life as possible. So there is a conservationist element to it, isn't there? You, ha you can't just let... Presumably, you, there's something about what you produce that you want to explore its robustness rather than it just falling apart immediately. No, anyway, it doesn't fall apart immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Give them some time to look at it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> well, we both had a go. It didn't work, did it? Anyway, thank you. The, the gentleman behind you. Um, could you tell me how you were affected by the Morgenthau plan and what inspired you? I should say I have a vested interest. <laughs> My name is Alan Morgenthau. <laughs> so I'd like to know more about the Morgenthau plan. You are, you are, you are his grandson? No, a distant relative. A di okay. You know, I, I found the Morgenthau plan so interesting, not because of, of, of the Morgenthau plan, but how it was received in Germany. The Morgenthau Plan gave, was heißt eine Steilvorlage in, 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 in an excuse to get to carry on, didn't it? No, 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 no. Eine Steilvorlage in, in the football. It's Steilvorlage. Can you translate this? I you love know, that our intellectual Germans can't go into football <laughs> terminology. <laughs> no, it was a big chance for Goebbels. Yes. This Morgenthau Plan. It was the biggest chance he got because he could then he could say to the Germans, fight because if you don't fight, you will see what will happen. So for this reason, I wasn't. It would be forgotten this Morgenthau plan if it wouldn't be such a, a help for Hitler, you know. Was it ever taught in the history that you did? Was the Morgenthau plan part of any curriculum, or was it something you discovered much this later? This I got in the school. <laughs> this, yes, from the Morgen. I, I had it from from the school, you know. I, I conserved it, and and but I was, you know, then. I, I can tell you the story. I, I, I made some flower paint. I like so much flowers, you know. I have, I have garden with roses and, and all kinds of flowers. I like them so much. And I painted them. And I got a bad conscience, you know. You cannot, you cannot do, do paintings in this world so affirm, affirmative. Affirm yes. So beautiful, so affirmative, yes. So affirmative. Positive. So I, I had, it was bad. Then I thought, I can turn it over, you know. I can say with Morgenthau, with the idea of Morgenthau, this would be Germany without any industry. It would be so wonderful, you know, <laughs> full of flowers, <laughs> full of green grass. And so I turned it in a cynical way around, you know. Is this okay? You understand? Yeah. <laughs> very, very interesting. Okay. At the back, and the, the lady there with the hand, and then the uh, lady there at the back. Um, I was very interested in your paintings with diamonds. Who, mm. Do you own all the diamonds? What, what did she ask? She, she, very interested in your paintings with the diamonds. Do you the own the diamonds? And you know, when I, when I got the first time money in the 80s, you know, I was quite, I became quite famous in the 80s, you know. <laughs> and then I all of a sudden had money. So I bought diamonds and then I th threw them the BBC made a film in, in, in 1991, and, and they showed me there was a tunnel going from Calais to Dover. They, they, they stopped it then. In the 19th century, they tried already to do a tunnel to, to France, you know. And 
we was in this tunnel and I threw the diamonds in the, in, the, in the dust, you know. I gave them away, I gave them back to earth. This was an action I liked very much. <laughs> but some are left and they are on the painting. <laughs> Back, you know, it's, it's like with the materia and antimateria. You know, some, you know, when, when the world was, was when it was exploding, the Big Bang, then there was materia and antimateria. What is it in English? Matter and antimatter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And some materia left. You know, the most of them was um, annulated because it was plus and minus, but some left. And these are the paintings that's left. <laughs> Yeah, lady there in the back, and then we'll do some in the front. Yeah, that's right. Hello, thank you. Um, I was wondering, with regard to the fact that you said this is the first time you've done a retrospective, looking back on your work all collected together and seeing pieces that you may not have had an opportunity to see because people have bought them and taken them away, so becoming reacquainted with them, how do you feel about the themes and topics you've been searching for and exploring over the years when you see all your work collected together from so many decades? Yes, I, I, I see that um, what, 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 what a feeling, what I had always, intuition, that I go in circles, you know? I rediscover things I, I still deal today. It looks completely different, perhaps, but it's, it's the same it's the same circles, just a little bit wider, you know, from the middle, then, then always wider. Okay. Does, does the exhibition actually, has it in any way made you think, ah, that's an area I now wish to continue exploring? Has it had a direct impact? Have you, have you gone back to the studio? Uh, no, it was not this uh, kind of direct statistic there. thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, lady here, and then a gentleman at the back there. Yeah. No, no, just have the microphone. Here we are. Um, I love your work, but you love nature and elements. Uh, I feel like sculpture it has all different shapes, but with your paintings, you do a square perimeter, or big or small. I feel in your work, why do you do that? Because then the nature is not as free as it should be. You yes, know? there is a big... This... Um, this uh, unterschied, this, um, a big difference between nature and art. There's a big difference between life and art, and be between nature and art is a big difference too. So the square is necessary that we can see this is no more nature. Because I ha the, hel the nature helps me, and I ha have my material in the nature. I, 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 um, I squeeze the nature, I, I work with the nature, but then the result is different from nature. So it's a border or a boundary that you want to play with? Yes, yes, it's, it's for this reason, I, I, I think also, for, for example, in museums. Uh, in, when I was young, they said always, the Schwellenangst muss überwunden werden. The, the threshold should yes. be taken away that everybody can come in. You know. I know, I want that everybody comes in, but there has to be a threshold. There has to be that you know now you are in another, in another sphere and you have to be prepared for another experience. Gentleman there. Thank you. If it's a jagged edge, why does it have to be squared? Hang on. Because it's square you don't find in nature. Yeah. Hello, Anselm. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here. Um, in 1988, uh, my, probably my first experience of contemporary art was journeying to see your high priestess at the Riverside in Hammersmith. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> it was uh, changing. Um, my question is, I actually studied history. Um, and re one of the reasons I studied history was, uh, I, I think one of my inspirations was, was a search for truth, a search for why the First World War happened, the search for why the Second World War happened, who were the good guys, who were the bad guys. Um, and then um, I kind of gave up on that because, uh, <laughs> um, because of the point you were making about the, the malleability of history, I thought. Unfortunately, I then became a lawyer. But, my, <laughs> but my, I suppose my question is, are you, in your art, can art or um, history move us towards the truth? Is, 
are you seeking truth for your work or, or is there some other project? Or is there no project at all? Mm -hmm. No, I think there's not a problem that there, the history doesn't exist, but you look for it. You know, you can look for, for the truth in the history and you will not find it, but you have to look it. And the way is the important thing to go there. But does art bring us closer to the truth if never actually realizing it? Um, I wouldn't say truth, I would say um, another word, um, more complex, yeah. more vivid, more, yes, complex. It, it's, it's um, you know, art, mythology gives, an, uh, for example, mythology gives another picture to the things. So scientists, they are, they are in, in drawers. You know, there's this drawer for this, this drawer for this. It's uh, organized. But the mythology gives a whole picture of the world. And um, that's what artists do. You cannot read it like an artist uh, looking uh, pieces in spectrum, you know, but, but um, you, you, you have to find your own language to understand it. Back to, to last two, I think, probably, because we've got three minutes, seven seconds. Let's see how we get on. <laughs> what, what role did your family have, in foster, if any, in fostering the artist in you, especially when you were really little? I didn't understand. What role did your family have in fostering the artist in you when you were little? Were you encouraged by your parents? Oh, yeah. They, they, they showed me the classic art, uh, like Velasquez, like... Um, like Matisse, Clay, and, 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 and they, they introduced me, yes. And were encouraging of you to think about being an artist in the end? I know you said your father wanted you to go to law No, school. they wanted me to be a teacher, yes. <laughs> <laughs> With a regular income. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the paintings that we saw on the slideshow entitled Shulamit and Margarita? The, the great Salan poems. Could you just talk about the Shulamit and, and Margarita paintings? They were done in the early 80s. Ah, yes. You know, I, I worked with straw in those times, you know, because of the color, the, 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 the yellow color it was very, very, very. And, and I lived in a, in a very rural district in Buchen in Germany. And I wanted to do something with straw. And the straw, all of a sudden, it was a hair of Margaret, you know? And then it comes in my mind again, this poem from Celan, what I learned in school. It was the only poem I learned. It's the only poem from Celan who is easy to understand, you know? It's, it's, and this I learned in school when I was in school. So I had this in my head, and, and then I, it was, all of a sudden it was Margaret, then Goldenes Haar, and Shulamit, then Ashenes Haar. Death Fugue. That's, yeah, the, the, the Todesfugue, yeah. Let's have one more question. Let me be rebellious in the middle there. Yeah. Good evening. I just wanted to know how uh, Kabbalah has influenced your, your art, if at all. No. It, I learned the Kabbalah through Gershom Sholem. And I, I, I told you, I, I read all his books because they are so, um, you want, I want to say easy to understand, but you can understand it. You know, it's not, it's not theoretical. It's, 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 it's written with blood, you know, it, it's wonderful. And so I, I, I read a lot about the Kabbalah. There are, lo there are different um, uh, strömungen, streams. It's, it's rich, this, 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 this field. And for all, I studied Isaac Luria, what I like very much. And he gave, he gave what, what I'm mostly impressed is, he gave a new idea how the world was born, you know. You know, in, I learned in school that there was God and made some figures with, with argil and, and, he, and then it was, it was the world, you know. But, but Isa Luria, it was more philosophical, it was much more intellectual. He said, you know this, no? He said, um, God is all. You know, it's a kind of 
pantheism. It could be, it could be the Leibniz pantheism, you know. And he, but he said, then God was retrieving himself a little bit to give free a space free that the world develops himself, you know. And it was very smart, you know, because the Catholicism and the Christians had always a problem with the bad in the world. They say God is fantastic, God is is uh, all powerful, powerful, and he is gütig, gütig. Generous, yes, and it's not true, you know. <laughs> he had a lot of problems to 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 say the other thing, you know. And this is a gloria. He said he he was retracting himself, and the world was and it was was very smart. You know, it was not only philosophically; it was also also smart, you know, to avoid this problem all the time. You know, all the scholastic philosophy they they always speak about that, you know, about its nonsense, you know. On which, okay, let's go on, let, let me break the rules. Let's have one more question, one more question. <laughs> we can do that and then we can. The microphone is coming racing down. I thought it'd be nice to end on a theological note, but let's see, let's see, let's see where we do end. Yeah. Um, can you define for yourself main drivers which help you to... Main what? Drivers. Drivers? Right. <laughs> what? Yeah. Mean, what, m what makes you yeah, carry what on being an artist? You, Why do you carry on being art? an artist? Ah. Can you define them for you? You mean why I did, didn't give up? No, no. What <laughs> well, that's not a bad question. <laughs> what makes you make your art? Is it pain or, or search for the truth? Or what can you define for yourself? It's your impossibility. Impossibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> impossibility is always a good note on which to end. <laughs> what does that mean? Impossibility. Tonight has been the possible, impossibly done. Anselm, yeah. thank you very much for your